Hi, my name's Chris Woods. I'm from CyberQ Group. We make your business cyber resilient. I'm watching the Holy Trinity Show. Oh, Woodsy, what an incredible and generous gent and a fantastic host in Suite 29, which he co-owns with his best mate, Tony Gibson. Without these two guys, I'm not seeing Aston Villa in comfort and in style and able to record the game so I could use the highlights afterwards. Do you know, Chris and Tony are great examples of so many Villa fans, like Paul Hansaker as well, who have gone on, worked their behinds off, become successful but then maintained their humility and their graciousness and, most importantly, their fervent Aston Villa support. It's remarkable to me. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you, gents, for letting me be in the Cyber Q group suite. And what a Saturday that was. I mean, I'm going to remember Saturday for a lot of reasons, but primarily the game because it came at a cost. Two very big points and Douglas Louise. So... Let's get into it. Aston Villa 3, Brentford 3. Prior to the Brentford game on Saturday and also before Wolves, we were simply inundated, Sandra and I, with well-wishers, people coming to say hi, thanking me for doing this show, and just basically encouraging us to keep going, which is so humbling somehow. And it's like having your battery recharged when you are encouraged so much here in the beating heart of Aston Villa Nation B6. So I'm ready to go now for the run in for the off season and for the start of next season until I come back again. And it was just wonderful. I mean, you see people watching the show because you get the numbers, but you don't really think about what it means to them. And uh, I really got that impression prior to both of the games. And in fact, people were giving us gifts. So now we have to either eat those gifts or stuff them into our already overpacked carry-on luggage because we're not checking our bags. In fact, one individual, and I'm so embarrassed I can't remember the name because I've got the memory of a goldfish and so many people came up to us, but he watches the show. He used to work at West Midlands Police and he actually gave me this. Look at this. Do you know how incredible this was to have? on Broad Street on a Saturday night. I didn't have to line up for anything. We walked straight on through to any club we wanted. I'd like to welcome you officially now to the Holy Trinity show where I review the three key issues and moments that define Villa 3, Brentford 3. I was the show's correspondent, giving Samir and Alex the day off to just focus on the match. To everyone that came by and said hi before the game, thank you. None of the coveted, limited edition, Holy Trinity Show 24-7 branded coasters are left, except for a small stack hidden somewhere inside Villa Park. The key numbers were really interesting. Brentford actually got into better goal-scoring areas than we did, which is reflected in the XG, and they created three big chances to R1. The service I used doesn't tell you what those specific chances were, but they also scored three goals in a game where they had less than one-third of the football overall. So you could say they were more clinical with the opportunities they created. And part of the problem, again, for us were the little individual moments when there was a contested ball between opposing players. We struggled with that again. And if we were able to get as granular as knowing when those lost duels occurred, well, I would imagine that many of them came from minutes 59 to 70. Early big issue in this game, I thought Diego Carlos was everything we always fantasized about in a central defender from the time that he signed from Sevilla. I know it's been a really tough run for the Brazilian because of injuries and whatnot, but in that first half, he was tidy, and boy, did he make some tackle in front of the whole end to snuff out a very good chance, and he didn't give a penalty away. Now, what happened after minute 59 was a concern, not just for Diego, but collectively among our back four, which will probably have to be addressed, but... 
It was such a good first half for Carlos. Big late issue and sticking with the Brazilian theme, Douglas Luiz's late, late yellow card might have been the last kick of the game. I knew it right away. So did Douglas. In fact, I believe he pulled his shirt over his head before the yellow card was even shown. But this is a symptom of having to chase a game, and it was reflective in how untidy we were with some of our passes and some of the duels lost, which then led to an avoidable foul. And I can't help but think, had we gone on and scored that third goal, Louise might have been substituted in and around or after the hour mark. Now, we do have McGinn as cover, but this is not optimal. Hi, Sean Till, and you're watching The Holy Trinity Show. Oh, that reminds me, I have my airplane reading all sorted out. This is Sean Teal's book, Here, There, and Everywhere. I've put a link so you can order yours in the description of this video. And a big issue in this game was Morgan off the mark, Morgan Rogers, who has been progressing. Do you know what was really interesting? To meet up with Kenny Swain, Villa's legend and European Cup winner from 82, I didn't realize that Kenny had a really important role with the FA in youth evaluation and progression, and he also did a lot of coaching development work and still kind of does to this day. And so he had a, a very large role in watching and evaluating players that are in the current England setup and also England youth internationals, one of whom would certainly have been Morgan Rogers. What excites a lot of people about our recently acquired 21-year-old is his insatiable thirst for knowledge and improvement and his desire to be a top, top professional and represent the three Lions at, as a full international. And I think we even saw just in this week some progression with Wolves. We saw his ability to maintain possession while wriggling out of tackles and duels. Then against Manchester City, what a lovely one-time, one-touch give-and-go that set up the only goal for Duran. And then in this game, he scores the goal, which will do wonders, not just for himself, but his teammates, the technical staff, and by scoring it in front of the whole 10, well, he's going to get a lot more fans on board, and I can't help but think this is going to help his confidence further. What excited me about this goal, and especially seeing it from behind Rodgers, was how he used the defender as a screen to block off the goalkeeper before placing it into the open space. And in order to make that happen, you got to do three things. You have to keep possession of the football in a very congested area while watching and lining it up. So you've got the defender in the eyesight of the goalkeeper. And then, of course, you have to deliver the ball into the back of the net. And he does all three things. And I feel like the, the real measure of a top, top pro is someone who can onboard information and then employ it as quickly as possible without having to be reminded all the time. And this goal furthers my belief that his best position is actually behind the striker in those congested areas. And I was so excited to see this goal live, and I hope I can one day look back and say, I was there when Rodgers scored the first of many. Big issue number three, wonderful Watkins. I think I've used that one before. But our Ollie has now surpassed his best ever goal tally in the Premier League. And in terms of goal involvements, he's still right at the top of the league with some very impressive company. And the fact that he scored two against his former side to go along with the one he scored there, well, he's helped us earn four out of six points against Brentford. Now, the first goal didn't necessarily change the dynamic of the game because it came at such a late point in the half with about six minutes to go. But that was also a great time for us to score and finally unlock the low block. His second one, though, earned us the point. Imagine if we didn't get that. And what I really appreciate about Watkins this season is he is scoring goals every which way. Glancing headers, full-on directed headers, left foot right foot, smashing it with laces, guiding it in stepped. We have one of the best strikers in the country right now. And I wasn't surprised to see him and Emmy Martinez start this game. And I'm also convinced that Ollie Watkins is actually a machine made of metal and electronics 
And at halftime at Wolves, he was pulled out because he needed some maintenance and recalibration. His miles had come up. He had to go to the shop. But it's the other stuff he does. Running the channels, occupying defenders, backing into them and holding up the ball. How many times did Emmy Martinez ping one of those driven balls and Watkins backs in, holds up, wins it, great first touch, and then keeps us in possession while gaining field distance, as they say. So fair play to the maintenance staff, I mean medical staff, for giving him the right oil and lube, I mean the right treatment to ensure that he was available for this game because imagine if we didn't have him in this game. I'm Paul Cadman, I am the Vice President of Acorns and you're watching the Holy Trinity Show. Oh, I wanted to send a quick shout out to a dedicated viewer of this show, Larry Byrne, down under. In Australia, Larry, thank you so much for watching. Of course, Australia is a full day ahead of us, so he already knew what happened in this game before we did, and he has to keep it quiet, naturally. But thank you, Larry, for watching, mate. Big issue number two, low block bafflement. This was, tactically and strategically, a very good performance by Brentford. It's funny because Tony Morley came into our suite afterwards and he said, you know what, Brentford got this spot on and we kind of could not deal with it. And he also said, you know, if Unai Emery is ever tempted away from Villa, Thomas Frank might not be a bad shout as manager, especially if he was able to work with a much higher quality of player. And, you know, you have to look sometimes at the value of each respective squad to give you a little bit of context about the difference in the quality of player. According to Transfer Market, Aston Villa's total squad value in euros is 646 million, Brentford's 426 million. So Villa seventh in the Premier League table of overall squad value, and Brentford is down in 11th. Over 200 million, though, between the squads is significant, not taking into account injuries again, of course. But on a Saturday, that all goes out the window because it's 11 men versus 11 men with high stakes. One team is chasing the championship. Champions League, the other is trying to avoid the drop zone. So it should come to no one's surprise, especially those who have scouted Villa this season, that Brentford set up in a mid to low block. And we seemed rather wary of the Brentford counter-attacking threat and sort of stayed rather low risk, moving the ball from side to side, not necessarily sending Ezri Konza to double up on Regulon. In fact, Regulon, Domsgaard, and Collins not only kept Bailey and Konza in check on our right side there left, but those three players ended up being hugely influential in what happened between minutes 59 and 68. And Unai Emery knows that we do have some technicians who are able to operate in those tight spaces and maybe break down those deep and very tight lines, and so I think he's perfectly happy to do what we do. Maintain control of the game, don't take undue risk, move the ball from side to side, wait for the opportunities, and wear the opponent out in those situations. But as every game passes by, and especially in these ones, it is quite obvious to me that an elite and mobile right back who is technically gifted, like Nedeljkovic is projected to be, I think we would have an easier time with doubling down on their left back in combination with Leon Bailey or Musa Diaby or whoever is playing on that side. Whereas Ezri Konza is wired to defend first and mind his own goal first. Morgan Rogers, for me, as I said earlier, is probably better suited to play in the interior of the field because he does operate well in tight spaces, but then he also becomes a secondary crossing target in the box. Jacob Ramsey's strength is that he is whip it quick on the left and he can get around the corner on guys. And when he combines with an equally tricky fullback like Alex Moreno at his best, who You've got some options on the left. I wish we had the same on the right. Somebody who can combine with Bailey or Diaby or whoever else to get to the byline and cut back those chaos-causing balls from the byline, which I talk about all the time. We have managed to, quite often, break down the low block this season, sometimes leaving it very late against sort of bottom teams in the Premier League or especially the Europa Conference League teams, which all seem to sit deep on us. 
But I think this is where we miss Emmy Buendia a little bit because I always thought that that was one of the reasons why we brought him in. And although Musa Diaby has shown flashes of technical brilliance this season, he still struggles at times knowing when to drive with the ball versus when to pass with the ball. Unai Emery said exactly that this week, that he just has to sometimes be a little bit more selective. But when you think about who we have... Buendia, Diaby, Bailey, Jacob Ramsey, Morgan Rogers, Yuri Tielemans, John McGinn, there sure seems to be enough there when everybody's fit to deal with low blocks and earlier in games. How do you like this division retro classic from Henson? This has to be one of my first favorite kits, probably because it came around during my formative Villa supporting years. This scheme was actually on the Sabudio team that I used in my first Villa parlor, so Big thanks to Samir and Tony for furnishing me with one. And you can order yours using the link I've supplied in the description of this video. And I also managed to take both Samir and Alex Dutton, senior video correspondents of this show, out for a nice curry on Saturday night at Kaba Beach in Mosley. Very good shout. It's tough sometimes to watch a game through your phone screen, so... I appreciate what Samir and Alex do for this show very much. Maybe my only regret of this trip was I didn't get to spend more time with Paul Ansaker, my sponsor at 24-7 Services. You know, it was just over a year that I was introduced to Paul through a mutual friend, Jerry O'Halloran, and that's when Paul proposed the idea of a sponsorship because he was such a big fan of this show, which I'm very flattered about. And here we are a year later, and not only... Am I doing this kind of full time? But 24-7 has completely rebranded and launched a new website. And there have been a few projects gained from this show. Long may that continue because when you support Paul, you are supporting me. You know how to get a hold of Paul Hansaker and 24-7 services. And thank you again to Paul, Ron, and the whole team. I wish I could have spent more time with them. And the number one big issue that defined Villa 3, Brentford 3, a nine-minute meltdown. The only thing that comes close to what happened on Saturday in recent history is, of course, the late collapse against Wolves, which came during the horrible stretch that saw Dean Smith dismissed. And I'm sitting there just up to the 59th minute thinking, man, my Villa Park record's going to be 1,000% by the time I get home, and I will still not have seen... Aston Villa concede at Villa Park. And I'm just wondering if some of the players on the field in Claret and Blue were thinking the same thing, the we got this feeling. Because so many times, especially at home, since Unai Emery arrived, the 2-0 goal was either the final goal of the game or it preceded us getting a third goal or more. There was, of course, the predictable tactical change that occurred after Villa went up 2-0 because Brentford started to throw caution to the wind. I mean, whether you lose 2 or 3-0 doesn't matter. The pressing became higher and harder. And to pull one straight out of the cliche cupboard once again, how many times have you heard the expression, a 2-0 lead is one of the most tenuous in sport because two things are happening simultaneously. One team is pulling its foot off the gas, the other one is flooring it. And those percentages collectively among the two teams can make a difference. When I'm at a live game, I always feel that I have some kind of duty or obligation to invest, concentrate, focus my energy on the game and support the team the same way that they would be engaged and invested and concentrating in the game. But you could feel at 2-0, even within the stadium, the vibe changing. It was kind of like a, we got this now vibe. Here comes another 3-4-0 to four nil win, three points incoming. And Ollie Watkins said afterwards, you know, at 2-0, we needed to adopt a big team mentality and be horrible to play against. I call that the nil-nil mentality. So the collective mentality at 2-0 was without question a factor in that collapse. And it's interesting also how when things start to change, the energy from the away support also starts to change, which is another wonderful and amazing thing about football in this country. Because in North America, 
We don't sit visiting supporters together in a section, so the sound isn't concentrated. And I could tell you, obviously, that in the four games I've seen at Villa Park, I have never heard that level of noise coming from the away support than when Brentford went 3-2 up. Mentality aside, that was a factor. Now we get into the forensic investigation of the technical and tactical over what happened during that nine-minute span and beyond. And for me, it was that Brentford started to press and press hard. I mean, this is a team that sat back, was totally happy for us to have the football and have them soak up the pressure, to now they're putting pressure on all over the park. And effective pressure, too, not just running around like headless chickens, but very coordinated, very precise as to how they came at the football. And that comes down to good coaching. And one of the complaints I have about Nicolo Zaniolo is I feel as though he's a very poor presser of the football. He is easy to bypass. I mean, at minimum, stop the progress of the ball or force your opponent to go backwards. But a couple of times in that second half, Zaniolo was bypassed very easily. And then what happens when you're being chased down and there's somebody nipping at your heels? Well, suddenly Aston Villa's passing precision and selection just went out the window. We could not retain the football. So the inability to deal with a press aside, the alarm bells should be ringing a little bit with our basic defending ability. We've now conceded more goals this season than we did all of last year, and we still have six games to play, including ones against Arsenal, Chelsea, and Liverpool. And I think of all the really big problems we're having is that we can't seem to defend across. You think about our recent history right now. We had the McTominay goal that won it against Manchester United. Then you had Madison's for Spurs and Mikhail Antonio at West Ham. And those goals had very similar hallmarks to the three goals Brentford scored. Players in great scoring positions that are not being marked, and therefore they have the ability to make a clean connection, or not a very clean connection in the case of the 1-2 goal, but... These are players that are uncontested in dangerous areas of the penalty area. I sometimes wonder if our obsession with keeping either a high or laser tight line at the back kind of supersedes the simple art of marking a man rather than space. And I'm not asking Pau Torres and Diego Carlos or Clement Longley to be wrestling a forward in the penalty box, but on all three of those Brentford goals, it appeared to me like our defenders didn't even know those guys were there and they were wide open to be able to make the connection. You could also ask some questions as to whether we worked hard enough to prevent those crosses in the first place, even though you have to give some credit to Regulon and Darmstadt for their deliveries into the danger area. So as it usually happens, it's not just one thing. It's the mental attitude. It's not dealing with the press. It's not marking men in the box. It's not shutting off the supply from the crossing. It's all these things that led to an absolutely remarkable period that I will never forget. I mean, it was something to witness live and if you're thinking about, again, another old cliche, you know, was that one point gained or two points lost? I'd say it was two points lost because we were at home and we scored in fantastic periods, late stages of the first half and very early in the second half. Time to tabulate the categories I've been following since starting this program as we drop more points at Villa Park. 13 points dropped now at home this season. Ollie Watkins adding to the combined goals for 18 and now 23 between he and Diaby. We dropped points against a bottom six side despite scoring first, which we did for the 17th time this season. And our first half plus minus has increased, but that second half plus minus has been dropping of late. And that's an interesting and revealing place we're at between those two numbers right now. Next up, it's Lille in the first leg of the Europa Conference League quarterfinal at Villa Park. Totally different dynamics starting at VP in this tie, which I don't think is an advantage at all. I'd much rather know what you need to do coming into your home game in that second leg. And if it does go the distance to penalties, well, wouldn't you rather have that at Villa Park? It's been a good season for Lille. They're third only behind Brest and PSG, and they had a very impressive win against Marseille on Friday night, 3-1. Friday night, so they've had several extra days of rest 
but with the greatest of respect to our opponents on Thursday. This is a side that Aston Villa should expect to get past and into the semi-final. And we know that Douglas Louise will start and probably go the full 90 in both legs of this tie. And for Lille, a Canadian leads the line up front. Jonathan David, who we've been linked with in the past. Very different striker from Ollie Watkins. Short, stocky, but clinical. 16 goals on the season. And another player we should probably watch out for is Benjamin Andre. He's their holding midfielder. Highly rated and I think an important cog if Lille want to get past us and into the semis. And so another incredible stretch in Birmingham has come to a close, complete with three very different games, including my first ever away experience, which I won't soon forget. But you know, last year when we came, we didn't really know a lot of people. We certainly didn't know the area, so we were a little tentative about going out and exploring. But this time, because we know so many more people and the area a little bit, we were far more adventurous, did more sightseeing, and it has been a blast. Everywhere we went, polite, nice, accommodating people. Food, magnificent. And what I love about Birmingham is there are still a lot of old buildings because I, I love the history here. But there's also a lot of modern and new buildings going up, which, you know, feels progressive to me. Could I live here? Could I settle into a nice little family bungalow in Lozelle's? Sure, I could. But you know what? Sometimes well, it's nice to get back to Canada as well. Until the next time. Be well, and as always, up the mighty villa.